I want to talk about our health system today. Actually, it's not really a health system. I'm actually talking about our sickness system. Uh, across the world, including Australia, we spend billions on health, but actually we spend billions on sickness. So really, in most developed countries, I think 99.9 something percent of the health spending is actually to fix sick people. And we're at a particular pain point in medicine now where we need to, to, to radically tip upside down our frontline drug treatment for frontline lifestyle medicine treatment. And today I want to talk about 10 lessons about how we might do that. The first thing whenever you're taking a lesson is to think about lessons from history. And medicine has always suffered pain points, uh, some of them quite painful. Let's look at a few of those. And it was 1847 that a uh, Semmelweis, an obstetrician practicing in the UK, discovered that washing his hands in chlorinated hand wash at a hospital after doing autopsies with, with dead mothers and then going and visiting the, the still live babies reduced the death by sepsis in those babies by ninefold, from 18% to 2%. And we now know that, that uh, in his treatise that was, that was accurate science because that sort of chlorination in the hand wash um, kills the very bugs that killed the babies. What happened to, to Semmelweis? He was publicly and medically ridiculed. He went into an asylum after a, a mental breakdown and perversely he died himself of sepsis in that institution. Uh, and it wasn't until decades later that uh, such an obvious technique was taken up more widely and saved um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives and still does today. More interestingly is uh, Dr. Lind, physician in the Royal Navy. And there was a little problem in the Royal Navy in Britain in the 1700s. In one voyage alone in 1743, of the 1800 sailors, 1,400 died because of scurvy, a, a, a disease of nutritional deficiency, a disease of mal malnourishment. Lind conducted and really should be considered the pioneer of modern nutritional science. He was the first uh, physician scientist to conduct a randomized control trial in nutrition. He uh, randomized uh, the delivery of lemons and limes to sailors. He was able to massively reduce the incidence of scurvy and the mortality of scurvy by half. What happened to Lind? Well, he eventually died in 1794, and it was a year after his death in 1795 that the British Navy finally adopted as policy uh, the use of fresh fruits, especially limes and, and lemons, in the British Navy. Pain points, and pain points that took decades to come about. Scurvy, scurvy, scurvy. I think this is perhaps the most perverse of them all, especially if you're a woman and especially if you've had breast cancer. So uh, James Holstead introduced the notion of the radical mastectomy in 1894, and he was relatively radical, dissecting uh, 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 breasts and, and parts of chest, but his disciples became even more radical. So over the next decades, the radical mastectomy transformed into full chest dissections, dissections of pectoral, pectoral muscles, dissections of the neck muscles, dissections of lymph nodes in the arms, uh, up into the neck, uh, and it was a brutal, nasty procedure that did save some lives, but disfigured and ruined the quality of life of many other women. Uh, and about 10% of women died in this procedure or shortly thereafter. And it wasn't until Bernard Fisher came along and really raised the debate as to whether or not simpler procedures like a lumpectomy, simply removing the, the tumorous lump in the breast, were going to be uh, as effective, less effective, uh, and there was, he was widely ridiculed and advocated for a randomized trial on this procedure. When indeed a randomized trial was finally conducted, what did they find? Well, they found in medicine what's called equivalency. The lumpectomy, in terms of benefit of survival from breast cancer, was as effective as the radical mastectomy. Now, perversely, in the United States alone, over that 70 odd years that that procedure was conducted, half a million U.S. women uh, underwent that uh, radical procedure uh, with 10% dying from the procedure and untold more suffering unnecessary harm 
uh, because of medicine's inability to move quickly enough. So we're in the modern world at another stage again, aren't we? Because we live a relatively long time, we've sorted out, sorted out communicable disease, but there's a major gap between our life expectancy and our health at life expectancy. Our mortality is good, but our morbidity, our quality of life, is not. We're around for a long time, but not a good time. And we know in Australia, when you look at this, the magnitude of this effect, and it's massive. So the World Health Organization conducts studies from time to time. Um, they do those around the world on quality of life, lost to poor health, and they did such a talk uh, such a study in 2015. There were 22.5 million people in Australia in 2015, and there are about 5 million years per year. So in 2015, there were 5 million years of life lost due to poor health. Those, you may have been alive, but your health was very poor. 5 million years per year. It's a massive massive number and it's the same is true in virtually every developed country around a quarter of all living years are lost to poor health okay well people get sick they're born that way well as it turns out congenital problems account for four percent of our, our loss of quality of life people get injured that's eight percent the remaining 88 percent are due to chronic preventable conditions and those are diabetes cancer uh, a whole bunch of uh, neurological issues, including mental health and depression, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke. And we know the cause of them. We think we know the cause, don't we? But we're actually looking at, these are symptoms in the self, this metabolic syndrome, fat around the tummy, high blood lipids, triglycerides, uh, poor HDL, uh, insulin resistance and hypertension. The real cause is lifestyle. We're not going to control this epidemic by medicating our way out of hypertension, poor blood lipids, insulin resistance, and, and visceral adiposity. We're going to have to change the way we live as a society. So we've come to a really tipping point in the world as to what we consider we should do about this. Are we going to continue to medicate ourselves and hope for the best and still suffer a, a poor quality of life? Are we going to spend billions of dollars doing that? Or even think seriously about changing the way that we live so we can be, and we know the things that do this. Uh, tobacco, and we're making serious efforts on that. Alcohol, the harm caused by that, some improvement. But the big two we're making no improvement on are how we eat, the quality of our diet, uh, where we get our food from, how we produce our food is a primary cause of harm and loss of life. Food is medicine. Uh, and how active and fit we are. We know we're doing worse on that. Australian children have become cumul cumulatively 10% less fit every decade for the last five decades. And, and that's even allowing for the fact that they're slightly fatter. We've still seen that drop in fitness. So our fitness has got worse, our food's got worse, uh, and we can't medicate our way out of it. Um, why not? Why not indeed when it's so important, would save us billions, would have much more of a good time while we're alive, and everything would be rosy. Why not indeed? Well, we haven't played the right cards, have we? In fact, we've, dealt, we've been dealt by a bung hand, and I'll t let's f figure out what's done that exactly. Uh, the first thing I would say is when you look at medicine and the money involved, there's conflicts of interest that are wholly unacceptable. Uh, this, there's two papers came out, one this year and one last year, and uh, this is uh, PLOS One, and another in the BMJ, just showing us the magnitude of what's going on in the investment of pharmaceutical and medical device companies in modern medicine. Here's the serial offender in our field, the Journal of the American College of Cardiologists. Here, stand by, is the median board fee for sitting on the editorial board of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And here's the median research stipend that they get as well. Ouch. No, that's dreadful. <laughs> it's dreadful. Actually, it's another D word. It's despicable. It's despicable that that's what's happening. This is not a fee commensurate with the work involved. And we're used to in society being ripped off by, I don't know, real estate agents, uh, 
uh, lawyers, but by our doctors are trying to make us healthy, no, not acceptable. And so let's put that in Australian dollars, 802,000, and in New Zealand rupees, <laughs> eight and a half billion. <laughs> but they're not the only ones, they're certainly the worst. Uh, diabetes care, which is very close to our heart in the uh, low carbohydrate community, uh, here's their fees. So we're looking at something like just under 100,000 US to, to be on the board and, and uh, just over 200,000 research stipend for being on the editorial board. Uh, this, um, as a society, is absolutely wholly unacceptable. In fact, I would go so far as the, the, the entire medical publishing field is unacceptable. From, from a researcher's point of view, I, uh, I conduct studies. Um, those are often paid for by the taxpayer. Uh, or whoever else we can get to do it, or even in our own time. And we finally get the results. We work for years on these studies. We take them to be published. Uh, we're, we're ravaged by reviewers with a massive conflict of interest, often in lifestyle medicine. We finally do get them published, and we get a, uh, a form to fill out, signing over all the intellectual property from that study to the journal. Um, and then we have to pay them several thousands of dollars to have the the paper available for people to see in open access. Uh, is there anywhere else in society that can happen? People bring their IP to you, for free they give it to you and sign it over, even though it costs them hundreds of thousands, often millions to develop it. Uh, and then, even when they've signed it over to you, they pay you again to make sure you put it online properly for them. You know, the system is utterly broken, not working at all. And that's how we get information out. Uh, and the BMJ, Paper says some pretty obvious things that we need to stop this and move on, uh, that sort of thing, which I'm sure uh, you will all agree with. And we've written about this ourselves. This is a paper published this year by uh, uh, Dr. Asim Mahotra, London, London cardiologist, a, uh, Dr. Rob Lustig, a San Francisco uh, pediatric endocrinologist, and myself. Uh, I was really thrilled to be with these two rock stars of, of the field, but really clearly outlining the tactics of the uh, food industry this time, not so much partially in medical publishing, but more broadly in how they affect the whole of society uh, with deception, with misinformation, with creating false lobby groups, with uh, buying off political favours and that sort of thing. And this is the consequence from that behaviour, big tobacco behaviour, mind you, same thing, uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, we've got this sort of fake food revolution, we've got all sorts of ticks on that, we've got claims of health when this is actually a pro-inflammatory, uh, insulin raising, glucose raising, uh, glucose raising uh, sugar laden junk food. This is exactly the sort of food that a generation grew up on that causes, and this is causal now in chronic disease unacceptable. Another company, another variety, and most perversely in Australia and New Zealand at the moment is now a government sponsored system called the Health Star Rating and uh, for all of you out there uh, what I would encourage you to do is uh, write to your local politician, uh, boycott this stuff at the supermarket, blog, Facebook, take photos of this, uh, make it known that this is a, a perversity of the highest order. We have a situation where high sugar, high processed food is endorsed by the Australian New Zealand government as being healthy. It was only last week that uh, I noticed that bottled water, bottled carbonated water, uh, because it has a little bit of sodium, it's actually a mineral water, uh, gets two stars out of five. Uh, at the same time, we have something like an up and go uh, flavoured drink which has as much sugar by volume as Coca-Cola, but because it has added vitamins and minerals, nutrients, uh, gets four and a half stars. And so the emperor here is naked, not wearing any clothes whatsoever, and uh, we as a society uh, need to call that. I'm doing it, so how about you? Next point, how are we taking evidence seriously? What are we doing with evidence? And Nutrition science is running amok. This fellow here, Dr. Bryant Wansink, uh, food and nutrition researcher, formerly, because he's just been fired for academic fraud, of Cornell University. He's had eight papers retracted from JAMA. 
uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, he had several more from other journals uh, for making up data, data mining and other, other unethical practices. So nutrition won't be the first, it won't be the last, he won't be the last, uh, but this runs uh, in it. Science does have an ethical code of conduct, believe it or not, um, it's riddled with us, but that's not actually where the major problems have started. It's a problem, but the major problem started with policy being introduced without any scientific evidence. And the most brutal of all that and the most stark of that is the 1977 US Department of Agriculture's food pyramid, uh, a uh, high grain, high carbohydrate, low fat way of eating. Uh, and if you go back and look, uh, Zoe Harcombe wrote this uh, uh, retrospective meta-analysis of the trials available at the time. There's absolutely no evidence when the McGovern Commission introduced this. Uh, not only that, many members of the McGovern Commission were actively uh, saying at the time that this was a hasty decision well before the evidence. And it's turned out to be exactly the case. So the fake food, the low-fat revolution, which is hopefully ending now, uh, started without scientific evidence. And it irks me in an age where we're talked to in the low-carbohydrate community with dozens of randomised trials showing the efficacy of, of ways of eating across a range of conditions that were accused of introduced way of eating, ways of eating by our colleagues, especially our older colleagues, without evidence. That's a clear case of the pot calling the kettle black because you guys didn't do it, did you? Eh? <laughs> and this paper recently published is also an indictment on modern scientific research because of the way we've started mining and conducting data rather than conducting actual experimental trials. So you might be aware uh, in the end of the sort of renaissance and medieval times there was a thing called the enlightenment. It was a really the view that God in fact wasn't responsible for everything and we could understand some forms of cause and effect by collecting data and doing experiments, trials. If I do this and observe this then that can happen. Uh, and, and Lind was doing those back with the British Navy with limes and we've done studies where we've changed one thing and seen how it affects other things, and we've advanced that to the randomised trial and those sorts of things over uh, many generations. We've refined their techniques, but why have we forgotten about them and why do we do so few of them? Uh, one interesting thing in this paper is the likelihood of finding results that aren't real. So if you went to high school uh, and possibly university, you'll recall type 1 and type 2 errors in statistics, finding things that aren't really there. I said it was real, there was an effect when in reality there wasn't. I didn't discover an effect when in fact there is one in reality. Now both of those have their issues. You say something wasn't there when it is, you're missing something interesting. You say something there is when it isn't, you're saying you, you could cause things to go horribly wrong. So it's interesting, our best evidence is still our randomised trials, but we still have a roughly a 50% chance of missing real effects and a 50% chance of finding them. These are simulations run by the authors. Uh, we do marginally better than that when we combine lots of well-conducted studies called meta-analyses. So those are really the top shelf things. Unfortunately, nutrition science in particular has really gone down to um, smaller, poorly conducted randomised trials, five times more chance now of finding results that aren't really true. Uh, and into larger scale epidemiology, 10 times more chance of finding what's not true, and then much more recently, mining big data post hoc without a hypothesis just to see what you'll find on a sort of, uh, what do they call it, pea fishing. Uh, you're looking for things that, that just pop up, and you've got a thousand times more chance of discovering something that isn't true. Uh, and, and that's the state. So you go and read the millions of nutrition papers that have come out over, over the decades and continue to come out every year. We're flooded by that. And my job, frankly, depends on publishing papers. Whether they're good or not is another thing. All that I need for people to do is to cite them so that they liked it as well and put Schofield et al. in their paper and I've got a great job for life because I'm so awesome. Unfortunately, most of that research is probably wrong, isn't it? because we've conducted studies that have much more chance of finding something that's not true, especially if we start to mine mindlessly large data sets without prior hypotheses. The best way of doing this 
is to start to conduct experiments uh, and see what's in them. And we could learn off smoking, actually, because sometimes you can't do experiments, but you can still find out things that are true or not. Uh, and we know that in the, in the time, in the 50s and 60s, when we discovered that smoking was between 12 and 20 times more likely to cause lung cancer than non-smokers, despite the non-smokers still being involved in, in inhaling secondhand smoke and poor quality air from all sorts of other things, including asbestosis and, and, uh, and leaded petrol and that sort of thing, uh, there was this massive, powerful effect. The industry tried to say, oh, it's correlation doesn't mean causation, and upstepped a new brand of statistics through this fellow here, Sir Austin Bradford Hill. And I think if nutritional science could take a step back and consider Bradford Hill's response to the smoking companies and their attempt to defeat research, we could learn a lot. If we use what became known as the Bradford Hill criteria, uh, then modern nutrition science would move forward in a coherent and productive way. And let me just work through some of those now. Bradford Hill said that you would need a strong effect. A hazard ratio in epidemiology might mean you're more than twice as likely to see it in one population with an exposure over two. Only then might we start to take things seriously. And as they go up from there, smoking, 12 to 20 times more likely. Those are the sorts of strong effects that give us cause to think that something's real. We'd like to also see it in different populations. It's happening in England. What's happening in Australia, in the United States? And we saw that in smoking. It was everywhere. Um, we'd like to see it in specific groups that just had that exposure. And we saw that as well. Well, you know, male of this age group smoked five times as much and we see a more specific effect. We would like to see uh, temporality. We don't expect you to start smoking and see lung cancer the next day. It'll be decades later, and that's indeed what we saw with, with, with uh, lung cancer. We'd like to see a biological gradient. The more you smoke, the worse it gets. The more crap food you eat, the more sugar you eat, the more diabetes you have, the more it rots your teeth, and we do see that. Biological plausibility. There needs to be some evidence of mechanisms here. It needs to be a coherent theory that sticks together and doesn't have exceptions. Uh, Ideally, we'd observe it by experiment, but I put it to you that actually, even though I've argued for the experiment, sometimes it's never going to be ethically possible. We were never going to do the smoking randomised trial. You don't smoke now, any of you, but we're going to force you to smoke for the next 20 years, and you, you might want to smoke, but we're going to make sure you stop. You clearly can't do that. And you'll see some similar things in nutrition. I put it to you that something like, uh, yeah, there's associational evidence that, that uh, teenage girls who eat vegan diets suffer uh, more depressive symptoms and are more likely to, to suffer severe depressive symptoms than uh, girls who eat omnivorously. That trial will never get done. It just won't happen. It's not ethical to do it, um, but we could discover that effect by working our way through the other things here. And you'll see a whole uh, analogy. Is it similar things do the same thing? And you'll see a bunch of epidemiological big data things here and a bunch of biological things here. If nutrition science applied the Bradford Hill criteria to public health recommendations around food um, and public policy, then we would be not in the mess we're in. And my call is that we start using these uh, all the time, please. And you can see in smoking, this is exactly the thing, big strong effects, 25 years into lung cancer develops from, from smoking incident goes up. When it goes down again, it goes down. Uh, we discovered the uh, effects of tar and, and, and the thousand other poisons in cigarettes on the lungs. We understand how tumours get formed, more or less. Uh, it makes sense without experiment. It's okay not to have experiments, but we prefer that we do wherever possible. By way of, of comparison to that smoking example, Here's a meta-analysis, and this is the only positive outcome from any meta-analysis on saturated fat and, and heart disease. And it, uh, across the eight odd that have been done, there's no effects on anything, um, except for in this Cochrane review by Hooper and et al., where they show for cardiovascular events, not death, uh, uh, that you get the small positive effect on adjusted risk. So even 
um, unadjusted. Those are the randomized trial results. That, that first blue dot doesn't cross one, so there's no effect. But if you start to adjust and play with the data and create something that doesn't exist, you actually get something that happens. Uh, that's nowhere near good enough for saying butter causes heart disease. It, it doesn't pass muster, doesn't meet it, um, end of story, thanks for coming, and that's just interesting as a study. Thanks, guys, but we shouldn't be uh, recommending that as something we take out of our diet because it's causal in heart disease. There is no evidence for that, so let's just get that clear. I also think we need to get comfortable with evolutionary biology and, and mismatch theory, the idea that humans have evolved. Uh, we've been on this planet for a, 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 a probably original uh, forms of humans, pre-humans, a million years, but in modern Homo sapiens for a, a few hundred thousand years, maybe 200,000 years. And the environments that we've been in to support this large brain don't exist anymore. And that mismatch between our evolutionary legacy and our, our current environment is crucial in understanding how humans are well, especially in the nutritional environment. Yet, in every other scientific and biological discipline, when you talk about evolutionary biology and comparative uh, biology and, and those sorts of paleolithic comparisons, that's just a reasonable thing to do. When you do it in nutrition, you're a wacko. And that seems odd. I find that bizarre. The facts are that we have a large brain. That brain doesn't shut down. It needs to maintain a stable energy supply and the only way to do that was to be able to get energy from hunting down large furry animals and eating all of them. And in times of famine, derive fuels from ketones, the byproducts of fatty acid. Humans are very, very good at storing fat and very, very good at fat burning. That is in our evolutionary legacy. And the, the metabolic flexibility to switch between carbohydrate metabolism and ketone metabolism uh, becomes obvious as a way to guide how healthy you are, especially through children. Now these are Gordon Cahill study from the 50s and 60s when you could um, do studies without proper ethics panels. He simply put prisoners uh, on starvation diets for a month and saw how they went. And uh, you can see that on the right there, that um, after just a couple of days, they don't turn stupid, uh, they don't lose too much energy, they uh, start to now fuel their brain and the rest of their body through the use of uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate acetate from, uh, uh, from uh, so-called ketones from fatty acid oxidation. These are uh, anti-inflammatory, nice, useful uh, things to happen to you. Uh, imagine if when you went starving, uh, you had no alternative fuel source and, and you turned fuzzy and dizzy and stupid. How would that be evolutionary? It wouldn't work. But what's even more fascinating, and Cahill, Cahill starved uh, little babies and, and little kids and slightly older kids, but he didn't have to do it for long because falling into a state of nutritional ketosis is neuroprotective and highly useful for, for uh, young humans. They do it in just a, an hour or two. This is a natural state to, and we think now, and I think the research will emerge in the next decade or two of the massive neuroprotective effects of, of uh, ketones in the blood. And this is one of the reasons I think why uh, infants on those little sippy cups full of uh, high carbohydrate juices, the sorts of uh, pureed uh, fruits and, and high sugar added uh, things that we give to kids, dial down nutritional ketosis, take away that anti-inflammatory signaling molecule uh, and neuroprotection and neurodevelopment from it uh, and promote just sugar burning which is, is inflammatory and that's something we immediately need to stop in our food environment for the sake of our future generations. Stop silly debates. Well, this is, of course, my, my, one of my favorite things. I think in, in nutritional science and public health, uh, why do we pit two healthy things against each other? Why are we interested in what's more important, diet or exercise? And I do hear things like you can't outrun a bad diet. And I agree with that. You can't exercise and expect to reap the benefits of a healthy diet, but being physically fit is important. So let's stop pitting diet and exercise against each other as whether what the relative importance of each other are. And I'd say to you, I'll put it to you, to consider the importance of your left foot and your left hand. And consider whether, how the amputation of those would affect you. And then would you say, well, would you rather have your left foot or your left hand amputated? Well, the answer, of course, is none. 
neither. I'd prefer none of them to be amputated because they're independently important. And the same is true of exercise and diet. And just to show you about exercise, I'm a serial exerciser. I like exercise. I've been physically fit my whole life. Um, it's been part of my research work, both uh, our fitness and, and activity as well as our diet. And so I'm passionate about both of those. But what I do get upset about is because sometimes you're called a foodie, and that's mainly a positive reflection on the fact that you're interested in food. But when they think about you being fit, people label you. So I head out of my office, going for a little run, and people go, look at him, he's a fitness freak. What's wrong with you, you freak? <laughs> and I don't think they're right. In fact, I think it's unfair. And then you'll be off and go, oh, look at you doing those fitness things again. You're out about, you know, what's wrong with you? That's not normal. Well, you know, I don't want to be part of that new normal, thank you very much, because the, the fitness benefits extend to all sorts of things. So here's a nice little example. These are survival curves. Uh, you know, people at some point in time, 100% of people are alive, and at some later point in time, no one is because we're mortal. Um, but it's how we, as a population, travel those trajectories that matter. And these two survival curves are between a group of 500 runners, age 50, followed in 1981 in California, members of a running club, ran three hours odd a week, quite a lot, quite fit. And they matched them with 500 odd non-runners, equivalently healthy at age 50, still did activity, but not nearly the amount this other group did. And look at the mortality after 21 years of follow-up. Just 15% of the runners had died, but 34% of the non-runners had died. If this was in medicine, it would be one of the biggest things you could take. It would be the blockbuster drug of all time. Halves death rate. Fitness is medicine, independent of what you eat. Eating would be just as important add that on. What's even more interesting here is just not the mortality, but the morbidity. So you remember morbidity is the idea of how well you lived, and the runners had an extra 13 years over those 21 years per runner, free of disability. So we talk about those causes of ill health and the prevention of them, and we can see where the medicine lies. Stop silly debates. They're both important. We need the world to change. Um, nutrition is important. Activity is important. Nutrition is in its scientific infancy. And we should acknowledge what we don't know and not pretend we know it. And science will keep changing. It's often said, and it was, I think, first said in, in medicine in 1936 by the then dean of the Harvard Medical School. Thanks for coming to Harvard, you graduating young doctors. Um, just letting you know that half of what you've learned is wrong. It's not clear to us which half that might be. And that's the way it's played out in medicine. We're constantly updating and scientific debate and robust debate um, and rejecting of hypotheses and taking up new things should be happening all the time. What we should see in our dietary guidelines and public policy are quite rapid changes because nutrition is advancing so quickly. Here's some of the things I think we don't yet know. We know something about the junctions and the tight junctions in our gut. We know that they loosen under some conditions. And we know that sometimes, maybe stress-related or, or food-related, they let through these lipopolysaccharides, gram-naked bacteria byproducts. They travel in to our bloodstream, and they're profoundly inflammatory. But we don't know exactly how they act. We don't know when they act, and we don't know how to mitigate that. And we call that endotoxicity. And you'll hear all sorts of bad things. I hope this field explodes in the next 20 years. This is profoundly interesting, as is the, the microbes, the fungi, and the viruses in our gut the genes of all of those organisms, and how they interact with our, us and our own genes. And genetics has promised us so much, but it was way more complicated than we thought, didn't we? Because we thought, well, was Mendel right, or was, uh, you know, with, with, were there other things right? You know, do you inherit genes? Uh, do, do, do they change in of yourself? Well, the answer is all of those things. Your genome's changing now. Since you started listening to this talk, there'll be transcriptions and changes, mainly because you're sitting around not doing anything. Um, and I'm moving around, so I'm making transcriptional changes as well. Our bodies are constantly updating, um, and those are actual changes in gene expression and sometimes changes in the genes themselves through methyl methylation. So we just don't understand it all. And here's my favourite. Well, not actually my favourite. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we've done, especially in exercise science that I've been involved in, we tend to study men. 
we don't study women. And in fact, I'm doing a study now when we're thinking about should we study men or women, and the answer is, oh my God, it's just too hard. And it's too hard because there's quite big hormonal changes across menstrual cycles. Now, I'm not comfortable talking about this, frankly, but I'm going to. And so here in this follicular phase, we see uh, progesterone's low. Estrogen starts to climb up during that. What's interesting there, that red line represents cravings for fatty, salty, and sugary food, preferably all three. Um, lowest during that phase. But interestingly, endurance performance is up some 18%. Fascinating. And then in this luteal phase, strength's up, cravings up, endurance down. And so this is the problem. When you get magnitudes of effects like that, and you wouldn't do scientific studies on women, sorry ladies, we've excluded you from everything. We don't actually in science really study half the population because it's too hard. You're too hard for us. And, and, but I think we will make massive breakthroughs here. And then there's even more interesting things, isn't there? Because things through perimenopause and then menopause and postmenopause, there's much more going on. Uh, we know that what we eat has profound effects on, on the expression of those hormones and how we cope with those changes through menopause, uh, yet we don't scientifically understand it yet. So stand by, we will change our mind again. And people keep saying in modern nutrition research, well, you're confusing us scientists. What's this public debate about? Well, science requires public debate. So I'm sorry if you don't like it, um, we won't advance science. And you can stick with the guidelines, so there. Um, so we will keep changing our mind. That's what we do. Uh, obsessions with obesity epidemic. I think obesity is a major societal problem, but, but when we concentrate that as the primary driver of how we should fix the nutrition environment, we get tripped up by these guys because they love confusion and obesity is frankly confusing. And there's multiple factors, there's most, multiple epidemiological factors, there's multiple causal factors, and um, uh, the food industry loves this. When I go on, and, and you see this, exercise is medicine, and then the next week you see it on the cover of the Medical Journal of Australia. I don't know if they're related, but it's probably not okay, is it? Choose more carefully. So when I go to, to, to talk about a healthy food environment, the things I talk about that I know are absolutely causal and they can't dodge. Sugar rots the teeth of our young people. The leading cause of hospitalisation in Australia, New Zealand, the United States, UK and Canada is poor oral health. To be, for young kids to be anaesthetised so that they can have their teeth fixed because they won't sit still when they're doing it with the local anaesthetic. Um, that's our major hospitalisation for our young people. Sugar causes that. Brushing our teeth is, is, is a sort of bottom of the, of the cliff strategy. If you want to fix it, we'd eat, eat less sugar uh, and less processed carbs in food. Uh, fat in the mouth, especially high fat dairy, is protective. And that's the sort of debate I want to have. In adults, I want to have the same debate, and I want to sort of bring in diabetes, especially type, uh, of course, type 2 diabetes. Um, sugar, uh, high carbohydrate inflammation causes that. Uh, dairy, high fat is protective. Uh, those are the facts of the matter. That's how to debate the food industry. Uh, let's not go toe to toe them with obesity because they're good at PR and marketing and they will eat us. And they have eaten us. Uh, and they are implicated in it and they know they're implicated in it and they're behaving like big tobacco. Medical decision making. I think that's an interesting one. I think the idea of the prescription is, is an is a interesting word. To me, when you're prescribed something, you're told to do something by your doctor or your health professional. Uh, and that's a problem on multiple levels. Um, actually, as a, as a former psychologist, I know that when you tell someone to do something, they almost certainly won't. Um, I also know it from being a husband. <laughs> I struggle with this. And I think most of us struggle with this. And this is the idea of the motivational interview. If you shut up and listen and ask people about how they're going, then they will tell you about the behaviors they want to change. And it invariably comes to their health. There's a second thing. The idea of a medication or a lifestyle treatment or any treatment in medicine is a shared decision between the doctor who will give you information about it and you who will judge the quality of the outcomes that they're talking about. If I give you this, then you've got a 100% chance of it getting better with no side effects. I think most of us would go, that's cool, I will do that. Oh, actually, 
Of every five people that take it, one person gets better. The other five are no better than doing nothing. Uh, and some of those people will suffer harms and not get better. Okay, well, I'm not so sure about that. I, I need to understand uh, the quality of those things. And we can, we can think about that. So, for example, let's just flip that on here. You've got one chance in five if you take this pill of dying instantaneously. But if you don't die instantaneously, you would add 10 years onto the quality and quantity of your life. Now, for most of you, think about it, you wouldn't do that, would you? I'm not doing it. But if you've got uh, terminal cancer in your palliative care, it's a very different decision. You would do that, wouldn't you? I probably would. Um, and so this number needed to treat and the number needed to harm is, varies by individual. So when someone says, I'm prepared to suffer brain fog and pains in my joints uh, if I avoid this, that might be a very different decision than you make or I make or someone else makes. So I think this clear description of how medications affect us and the number needed to treat is something we can progress in medicine and information. Speaking of medical information, um, this must be amongst the, the, the worst examples in the world of how to communicate in the modern age. The modern blood test form is utterly undecipherable by anyone who doesn't know anything extensive about blood tests, and even then you have to search through it to find out the relevant information, which is only small amounts there. Um, surely we can do better in our decision making and sharing with patients in modern medicine um, about how they're doing. Surely. Someone do it out there, please. Medical education for lifestyle. Um, to me, this is lacking, and that's why I'm involved in uh, this organisation, Precure. Prevention is cure, with a K. And what we're doing here is two things. It's a social enterprise, so we'll make freely available lifestyle prescription programmes for people to do, and we'll make the evidence available online and make it radically transparent. You can search up who you are, your demographic and how people do, um, how adherence and everything else that is known to affect this sort of stuff does. Um, you can search through and make your own decision um, as a consumer and as a medical professional. The second thing we'll be doing is, and maybe good luck with this, so get, I'll get back to you, is to um, help the medical profession do more continuing medical education on lifestyle uh, as prevention. And uh, food is medicine, fitness is medicine, Prevention is cure. There's not a single disease in the history of humans that's been cured by curing the symptoms. Every disease that's been sorted has been sorted by preventing it in the first place. And that's what we must do in lifestyle disease, and what, what we must do in cancer, we, what we must do in cardiovascular disease and stroke, it's what we must do in dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, it's what we must do in diabetes. I think as... I get more into the medical system and understand exactly how it works. One really positive thing is advanced care planning. Sort of like a will for your health. Uh, it's, it was originally designed to say, well, look, there's needless resuscitations in, in, in hospitals. People are dying terrifying deaths with people leaning all over them, trying to revive them, when in fact they're mostly dead. And we're seeing a third of health spending in the last few months of people's lives, getting treatments that they never asked for, and never wanted that often neither pr uh, prolong the quality or the quantity of their life. If they were asked in advance, when they were able to give rational decisions and, were, were, and could do that, then almost everyone gives a very different answer than what happens to them in a hospital. And we can do better than that. So advanced care planning allows for that, but when you work through the advanced care planning, if you haven't done one of these, I encourage you to do so regardless of your age. It's interesting to think about because they always start going, what are your values in life? What do you want out of life? Um, how would you like your health to be in the later ages? No one has ever answered that going, I'd like to be sick on medication and suffer a dozen years of disability. It has never happened. Yet that's the fate of 95% of us in this country. And so when people start to talk about this earlier and earlier, first of all, we avoid that spending and we spend it somewhere else. But we can also uh, reduce suffering, reduce anguish, have deaths that are dignified rather than terrifying. Just think about that. Who wants a terrifying death in a hospital with people clambering all over them? No one. 
It's despicable. And we can do better, and we will do better. And the more that we work with advanced care planning at a younger stage, and it becomes a normal part of medicine, then it naturally transitions into lifestyle medicine because it's the only way of maintaining the sort of life that you advocate for and you want. Lesson nine, modern communication, we've won battles. If you haven't noticed, over the last decade, but particularly the last five years, it's now common public opinion and knowledge that sugar is bad for you. Cereals are a poor breakfast. They have plummeted in sales on both of those categories year after year after year for the last decade, and they will continue to do so. Our advocacy has won battles. We now understand that saturated fat isn't the demon that it was set out to be, and butter sales have doubled and tripled in most countries, and the price, at least in my country, has doubled or tripled, unfortunately. Uh, but we've won some of those battles, so let's not acknowledge that they, they have been won, but we must... Con and the reason they've been won is that we've been quite good at using modern communication, and the world has opened up so that the library card doesn't just belong to Professor So-and-so at So-and-so Medical School. The library card belongs to everyone now because information is freely available. Whether it's always good or not is another, another interesting question, but when it's available, we've seen the entrance to the nutrition and health community of engineers, of lay people, uh, of extremely intelligent people that don't have the biases and the dissonance that we were trained with. They find it much easier to not fool themselves. And it was once said that the trouble in science is that you must not fool yourself and the easiest person to fool is yourself. That was Richard Feynman, the physicist, and I think he was right. Lastly, and this is because I've been doing this, I've spent the last year and a half on the payroll of the New Zealand government um, as the chief uh, health and nutrition advisor for the Ministry of Education, and I felt by being a public servant I could get into and influence the system. And I regret to tell you that's not true. In fact, in many ways, it makes you worse at influencing the system because you can't say publicly what you think. You just need to go along with the status quo. The people who decide what public policy ultimately is are the politicians themselves. And in Australia and New Zealand, we have very few scientists um, and very few medical people ever running for office. We have virtually no influence in the sphere. And so you end up with um, an evidence-free zone of medicine. Who is the Prime Minister of Australia, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Rolf Harris? No, he's not. <laughs> he was on the TV for something else. Come on. <laughs> but the, we do need to do better. In my country, the only scientists in Parliament are uh, uh, an art expo exposition of um, famous New Zealand scientists. So, you know, there's two of them there, and that's uh, great. So, we can do better uh, if you want to do that. So that's all I've got for today. We're going to finish up. Oh, we took all the time, but thank you very much.